you've got basically three parts. You've got the, the ice face, you've got the explosion in the middle, and then you've got the water down below. Now the water is closer to us. It's a warmer green. Uh, it's, we're gonna leave that dry paper and we'll do sort of a dry brush across here to get some of the sparkle of the water. We'll leave some, a lighter area. If you look at my, uh, my painting, I left a little lighter area beneath it that would be uh, the reflection of this big splash that's very white. And the splash itself is gonna be dry. We're gonna leave that dry and come back in in the second half of our workshop to, to introduce the, the little shadowing and the dark uh, accents within that, but it, the, it's predominantly a dry negative shape. Um, so what we're going to do this morning, is, or this whatever time it is in your time zone, we're gonna wet the, the part of the uh, ice face that is visible behind this splashing explosion of, of where the ice has hit the water and it's splashed up. And then we'll introduce some underpainting of some very cool colors. And just so you're thinking about it, uh, the colors I'm going to be using will be predominantly cerulean blue, manganese blue, uh, a little bit of cobalt blue. And then I might add a little bit of turquoise, which will warm it up. Uh, when I say turquoise, it's like a co light cobalt teal, um, which is a kind of a, a warmish turquoise, but very light color. And we're going to introduce some quinacridone rose, which warms it up. If you don't have that, uh, you can also use bright violet. Uh, alizarin crimson might be a little bit too raw. So if you've got some, some, some type of pinks, uh, while this is wet, we will be dropping some of these other colors in to charge this wash that we're going to create around the negative shape of the splash. We'll paint the water probably at the last part of the first half of our painting. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pull these away so you can see the, the actual painting that I did. Um, we're not going to put these darks in until all this wet and wet area that we painted as an underpainting is dry. It has to be dry in order to get a hard mark or a hard line or edge. And if you try to do this while the paper is damp, it's going to get muddy and it's not going to give you a, a nice crisp edge. So it's very important that we lay down basically a wet surface, clean water. Doesn't have to be real wet, but uh, just damp so that when we start laying in some of these cooler colors as an underpainting, you will get a nice soft transition. Now, keep in mind, this area in the upper left is going to be uh, getting a little more light. It's a, it's not completely horizontal, but it's much more horizontal in surface than the vertical face of the cliff. So it's going to be lighter in value. It's got some warmth to it, whereas this all this shadowy area on the face is a lot cooler. So I'll pull this away, and you can see my line drawing that I'm going to work with here. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And I'll take a big brush like this, and I'm going to use this to just start applying some water. And I'm just going to work vertically. And I'm going to kind of use the edge of my brush to kind of jag in around the shape of my splash. And I have very lightly kind of delineated an area that I've, I've designated for the splash. And I don't want to go right up to the pencil lines too much. I just want to come right down to the water line come back up from the waterline up to the top of the page and then fill in all this paper. I'll do a little cross hatching as well to make sure that I get the surface nice and wet. Now I've got huge beads of water because my board is on a, a roll of tape. I'm gonna take one of the rolls of tape out so it's a little less of an angle and that will allow this um, wet surface to soak into the paper a little more evenly without uh, creating any uh, big puddles that beat up along the bottom edge of this where the water runs downhill. Now, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the fact that I've got this wet. I'm going to take my palette now, and I like to hold my palette because I've, I've ended up moving towards a smaller one. It's got a little thumb hole in the, in the ring in the bottom, but I can pick this up and I've got a squirt of, of cerulean blue. I've got a squirt of manganese blue. I normally don't keep those in my palette, but for this particular painting, we needed those colors. So I'm gonna get a little of this 
worked in as a nice wash in one of my mixing wells. Now the, the manganese blue is a much warmer blue than the cerulean blue. Here's the cerulean blue over here. It's gonna move a little more towards the cooler side, but I'll use elements of both. So now I've got a nice mix on my brush. I'm gonna just start coming down and working in and just tinting the papers really. And it doesn't, you don't have to be perfect. You just wanna lay some of this pigment down in a couple of places. And I'm working in around beneath that, that little ridge line there. And my water or the wet surface of my paper grabs this paint and it just diffuses and it turns into a really nice, soft, wet and wet effect. And I'll come back up in a minute and add some warmer colors. But now you can start to see the shape of my splash that we created that I lightly penciled in that you probably couldn't see because it's white, such a white paper. But uh, now you can start to see that it's there and uh, just grab some more of this pigment, come down along the edge here. And I'm just gonna come across this with just a little bit lighter value of wash. So it isn't a real hard edge. But we'll bring this down, get some more down towards the bottom. I want this fairly uh, cool as we get come down towards the uh, the bottom of the ice face. And that went pretty fast. Now we don't want to stop here. So because we want to utilize this wet surface, I'm going to take a tissue and wick up some of the excess water that's around the edge so that it doesn't uh, get out of control here. But uh, for the most part, we'll let this surface continue to be wet. And now I'm gonna go back and get a little bit of this uh, quinacridone rose that I've got, just a little bit of a warmish tone. I'm gonna put a little bit of that up on the top here. I'm gonna let this just kind of jump in in a few places and there's no rhyme or reason to this. I'm just trying to balance some of the coolness with a, just a little bit of the warmth in here. And I'm not leaving any defined marks because it's so wet, it just kind of blends and softens and moves into this. But as our, our value comes in and around the splash area, we want to uh, take a smaller brush and I wanna get just a little bit of cobalt and I'm mixing this up in the side here in a different uh, area in my mixing well. And you can see the from the uh, the mixing well here, this is a lot, a lot uh, I don't know what you'd call it. It's a darker, deeper blue than these ceruleans and manganese. But this little area right in here, I'm going to come in and leave some, it's dry, but I'm just going to come in and drop in a few of these little marks to suggest and leave some whites in here that are big chunks of snow and ice that are fracturing away and leaving these little white shapes. I don't want them to all be the same size. I'm going to get a variety in there. And then I'll go back in and I'll drop more of this, this cobalt up into this edge over here because it's off the page. It's a little bit in shadow. So I want to drop the, the value down quite a bit and cool it off. So it really stays nice and cool. And then the same thing is gonna occur over on the other side. I want this to be a little bit cooler as, it, as the paper or as the composition rolls off to the right. This is all gonna dry pretty, pretty light. So I'm not too concerned about it being perfect. I'm gonna take a little bit of this, this cobalt up into the upper area as well, but I wanna leave a little lighter area as it reaches that rim, um, just so that it feels like it's, it's catching more light and we get more contrast with the, the shadowed vertical surface. That went pretty fast. And I'm just going back and just throwing in some very pale bits of cool on the top surface here that I had left lighter. You can definitely see that the face of this uh, uh, exploding water and the, and the ice cliff is a lot cooler and a lot, uh, got a lot more coolness to it than the upper ridge above this. Um, so I'm gonna add a little bit more 
right up in here, just use a little bit of a uh, little drier paint and we'll drop in and let that run, let the gravity pull that downward. So it just sort of runs downhill. I'm gonna wick up and wipe off some of the beads that are collecting right along the, uh, the edge here of the water line. And now we're at a point where I can set my palette down. I'm gonna clean up the edge of my painting and I'm gonna let it dry. So I'm gonna let you paint that. It went pretty fast, but you have to move fairly quickly with working wet and wet like this to start dropping in some of these warm pink colors on top of that, uh, that cool color. And now that it's starting to, the, the wet and wet is settling down, I'm picking up a little bit of pink here and there and dropping some into the, some of these places. And it'll, it'll blend by itself right in with all this, this blue that we've got. I'm gonna get a little bit warmer, I'm sorry, darker value right up against this big splash so that we start to see more value contrast. And I'm not painting right up to the line because I'll probably go back in and erase my pencil line because this whole thing is gonna be very transparent. But you can see how I laid down quite a bit of a value in contrast with that uh, white splashed area. And it creates a nice uh, bit of contrast to show off where the, the explosion of uh, foam is coming up out of the, the seabed. Um, so we'll stop there and let you finish that painting. And then while you're doing that, I'm gonna be drying this so that uh, I can keep moving right along. So if anybody has any questions, they can let uh, Lois know and I'll answer those while we're talking. I've got a big glare of light coming through from my window. That's the disadvantage of painting early in the morning like this. I get I have all my blinds shut, trying to prevent any glare on this, but uh, occasionally it creeps through. I'm gonna take my small brush and, and just kind of manipulate some of these little explosions of uh, chunks of, of uh, snow and ice so that they're not all exactly the same and start working into uh, a little farther into this uh, white area just to sort of create more of a sense of exploding um, ice. And I can also come down in and create secondary uh, piles of foam that are building up. And I'll just take a little bit of that pink and drop that in in a couple of spots and get a little bit of uh, neutral tint. So some of these get a little grayer. Clean my brush and just feather away these, these uh, little shadowy marks that are in the midst of all this exploding foam. Don't need much. There we go. Now I'm sure that some of your papers are bowing up with all the water that we put on there. When the paper starts going back flat, that tells you it's starting to dry. So there's, now this, this uh, probably looked like it was going down pretty dark, but as you see, when it dries, it dries very pale. And we're gonna be laying in some additional layers of color, but you can't do that unless you completely dry the paper to set that pigment and, and get it permanently staining the page. Then when it's dry, you can glaze in another color and another color and build up depth and, and crevices and, and lots of uh, texture to the surface. But you've got to get this nice and dry first. I'm using a, a heat gun. It, uh, it's a lot quieter than a hairdryer. If you're muted, you can use your hairdryer and it won't bother anybody. But I wanted to be able to continue talking so you can hear me. And uh, that's why I use this heat gun. It does not dry the paper as fast as a hairdryer, but sometimes that's a good thing. Now, my pencil lines are still very visible through this, this very pale wash that I put over. And as it dries, it gets lighter and lighter. And I can see where the rim of the, uh, the top surface kind of uh, 
leads over the face of the cliff. And I can come back in now with some darker colors and I can create lots more texture and shadow, more contrast in the shadowy areas. So how are we doing there? Is everybody uh, ready for me to go on to the next step? Or do you want to just keep painting and doing your wet and wet work for the face? We, we can uh, hold up just a little bit, give everybody a chance to get to this point. And then while I'm painting the next step, you can be watching and also drying. I think when, uh, when you're ready, everyone's ready, please write ready in the chat and that gives us okay. an idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait till you give me the green light. I'll let you kind of monitor what people, if people are still frantically painting, I'll wait. I don't want to get too far ahead. Now I've got a lot of light area up here at the top, so I'm going to probably um, lay in some very light glazes of value there as well. I want to pick up a little bit warmer color, so I'm going to pick up some of this turquoise along with the manganese and then add lots of water to that so it's just a glaze. And I'll come across the top and it's almost like a dry brush effect in a couple places. So it just, I'm slapping it on pretty loose because this is full of crags and, and texture and, and stuff that's broken. And I, you don't have to be too, too careful with this. Where you have to be careful is when we come in with our, our dark shadow line and that's where we create and define the shape of this cliff. But for now, that works pretty well. Uh, I add a little bit more of the pink up in here just to warm that up a bit. And I think this needs to be a little darker. So I'm going to get cobalt and get a, a glaze going for that. And we'll just kind of come down in here. Very wet. And you just have to use lots of water. It's a very light glaze. The paper has to be dry to go back over this second step. If your paper is not dry before you do this, you're going to create a muddy effect but it'll stay nice and, and clean looking and spontaneous if your paper is thoroughly dry before you start glazing on uh, any additional values. Now, everything I've put on here to this point has been very, very cool in color. I'm gonna pick up just a touch of glaze in a yellow okra, which is uh, maybe even a little bit of raw umber. Raw umber might be a better solution at this point but it, it has to be watered down pretty good because I don't want it to take over anything. But I'm gonna throw on just a little bit of warmth in some of these wet areas up in here, just with that little bit of, of watered down raw umber. And it just makes this feel like it's catching a little bit more light up there. I'm still leaving a, a fairly light area along the rim where uh, the, the light is catching a horizontal surface versus where I'm gonna come in with my, my vertical surface, it'll be a lot cooler. So we'll let that dry. And I think uh, as soon as I have this dry, we'll go on to the next step. So it'll give you time to complete what you're working on there. Here, let me just soften this a little bit. I put a, a big glaze over on the right, so this is still very, very wet. I want to make sure that this has a chance to dry before I go back in and start defining the, uh, the shape with a little bit more coolness under these rooms. I'm not going to paint in the crevices yet. I just want to establish the overall uh, shadow line where it transitions from a horizontal ice cap to the vertical cliff. So at this point, I'm just gonna work with this medium sized flat. I'll hold it here in front of the camera so you can see it. And I'm sorry about that, uh, that, gl that glare on there coming through my blinds and I can't really change that. So now I go back to, uh, to my uh, cobalt and it's a little bit darker and I'm gonna come back in now and just really kind of come in under my pencil lines in a few places here not everywhere, but just a couple of places and create a darker definition or transition in a few spots where we're uh, seeing part of the cliff. And then I'll, I'll uh, clean my brush 
and then just pull this darker bit of, of pigment downward into the rest of the painting. So I've just simply established a change in plane, which gets a change in light. And I'm going to leave some of the light on some of these areas, but it's mainly right up underneath that that I want to establish that nice, cool transition. And as it comes down, it doesn't need to stay as dark. It just needs to be right up in that one little area where we're defining the shape of where the, the little gullies are that go down uh, vertically to create this cliff. Get right up in here with some nice crisp color. Same with a uh, little bit of uh, just a touch of Payne's gray in with my cobalt. Clean my brush and just pull a little bit of water up towards those puddles of dark and let them start coming downhill. All right, I'll leave that alone. I'll let you do that. Get that dry. If you have a hard edge somewhere that looks like it's inappropriate, just take a damp brush and soften that edge, feather it a little bit, and you're in good shape. Now, this is really kind of a raw blue up there. So I'm going to add just a touch of Payne's gray while that's wet to neutralize that as a shadow so it isn't quite so raw. It's, it's, I'm going to make this dark anyway. So I'm just dropping in just a, a touch of very watered down Payne's gray to that raw blue up in that, that crevice so that it doesn't look quite so uh, circusy blue. We want to just make it more neutral, a little less uh, intense. All right, we've got our, our rock face or our ice face underpainting, pretty well done. The next thing I want to do is come back in and put some water in the ocean in the lower quarter of your painting. So while you're finishing up with this, I'll talk a little bit about what my, my thought process is on the water. The water is a lot warmer in appearance and, and hue. So I'll use probably a little bit of sap green and some cobalt. And we'll see how that looks mixed up. I'll, I'll hold my, my, uh, my palette over here so you can see a little bit of sap green. That's way too warm. So I want to take some cobalt. And they also want to take a little bit of, of uh, raw umber to those colors. And that, that raw umber is what warms up the bluish color. But it's not that cool color that you get on the ice face. It's, it's a different color altogether. And that's what makes that water feel like it's coming forward. Now, I'm, this is too narrow of a brush. I want to use a bigger brush for this. I just use this to kind of mix up my, my base color here in my palette. So I'm, I'm just going to set that aside and go back to a wider brush. I'll get it just barely damp here. And I want to pick this up as a drier bit of pigment. Um, get some more blue and some more raw umber in there. And, I, and, and the reason I'm trying to get this a little drier in my palette to get the right consistency is to get a nice dry brush effect as we uh, skip across the water. So I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to get right underneath this return under the shelf ice shelf and I'll, I'll drag my brush along the knife edge, get some darks in there right behind this water so we really see that spill out of the uh, of the uh, foam run out. Add a little bit of water what there. What color did you mix of... with the raw umber, please, Randy? I'm mixing it with sap green and cobalt blue. And so I'll have different consistency. Some of my brush strokes will have a little bit more cobalt. Some will have a little bit more raw umber. Come over to the other side and do the same thing. And I'm just dragging this around and I've, I've Put a pencil line in here to kind of give me a guidance on keeping this foam run out fairly level 
So parts of it come forward, but then as, as we look at the bottom edge of it, we want to maintain a true horizontal. Water always seeks level. So if, you're, if your water line is running downhill, it's, it's going to create a problem for the viewer. They're going to look at that and go, what is going on? So you want to make sure that you've got a nice level within these shapes. Now, I've got a little bit of, of uh, uh, ice floating out here in the water. So I'm going to leave a negative shape for that. Actually, there's two of them. And I'm painting around those with this wet brush. Leave a little bit of water in there. Now, this is where I take my, my two colors, and I'm just going to kind of come across from each side towards the, to, towards the middle. And I'm leaving a lighter, I'm purposely leaving it a little lighter here in the middle because that foam is so bright and white that we want to maintain a lighter value um, beneath it, like a reflection. So I've got to come back in now and get a little bit more uh, sap green and maybe a little ultramarine with my cobalt. We'll see how that works. And we'll just drop that in there, get it nice and dark over the edges. And we'll uh, get some more ultra or get some more raw umber in here to warm this up in a few places. I think that's okay. Now, what you can do, take a rigger and maybe drop a little bit of uh, water down towards the bottom of the center part of your painting, the bottom edge, and that water will hit some of this other wet area and start running. We can go and put another piece of tape underneath our angle to create a little more uh, gravity pull to that, and it'll start running downhill and create more of a fluid look. You can always come back with a little bit drier paint and drop in a darker mark here and there. You don't have to be Perfect. I mean, you don't want this water to all be uniform. There's lots of colors and, and temperature changes within this. And as we get back towards the underside of this, uh, this shelf, ice shelf, we want to get our darks in there. And we'll just let the water take over. We don't, don't worry about it too much. It's, uh, you never know quite what you're going to get but you have to be willing to trust and let the water do the work. So I'm gonna take a squirt bottle, right kind of in the center here and get this running a little bit more. It, it pulls all that pigment together, smooths it out. And I've got too much of a line right underneath the, uh, this front roll out of foam. So I'm gonna just soften that a little bit by adding some, just some glaze of ultramarine. And we'll let that just run downhill, and do its thing. But now, once this starts to set up, if you go back and get a little bit of that raw umber and a little bit of the, uh, you know, some of the different colors we worked in, just build up that, that value out on the edges so that it feels darker to the left and to the right side. And in the center, we have a lighter area beneath that that foam explosion. And the raw umber with a little bit of ultramarine really helps take that water down on the, on the outer edges and makes it darker. I think I lost my little, what do you call it? The little uh, ice cap things there that are floating. I can sometimes come back and retrieve. One of the things we can always do in a painting is take a little bit of magic eraser. And once everything's dry, you can go back and put masking tape around this and just lift your pigment and get a nice bright white of the paper retrieved and re, uh, you know retrieve it. So I feel like we got this going pretty well. I would uh, suggest that you guys go ahead and do this. And I'm just putting different colors in here that are a little darker. They're definitely a different uh, hue than, than what's in the uh, ice face. And I'm, I, I had a little bit of turquoise there. Now I'm adding some, 
some uh, raw umber over the top of that to warm it up a little bit. And we're going to put some, some splatter later of white. So you definitely want to have some areas in your water that are really dark. And this, remember, this is going to dry 50% lighter. So if we don't get this dark enough now, it's, uh, it's things aren't going to show up later. And you're going to see lots of little kind of textural ripples in the water. So if you come back with your brush while this is still wet and you're dropping in these darks, these will be very soft, um, feathery marks. And then you won't see a lot of hard edges in there, but you'll feel the temperature change within the, uh, the water. So it does its trick. Now, can you see how that sort of mimics the shape of the, of the, uh, the explosion of foam in the water beneath? It's, uh, it's dark, darker than the, the white of the paper above, but it's, uh, trying to think what I'm trying to say here. It's, it's uh, definitely a reflection of the reality above the waterline. So leave it at that. I'll let you kind of play with that. That is part two of the, the three shapes that we're working on. And I always go back with a little tissue and I kind of wick up all this, this kind of bead of water that's built up on the, along the edge of the tape. If I don't do that, what's gonna happen is that water will sit on the edge of your painting. And then while you're working up somewhere else in the painting later, it'll start creeping into all that really dark pigment and create kind of unnatural looking blooms that maybe are inappropriate. So if you control that now, it's just kind of water management, wicking up all this excess moisture to protect the direction your painting is going so that your end result will be what you're visualizing now, instead of having kind of a, a surprise when you weren't expecting it. All right, now I'm gonna dry this just so that we can keep moving through here fairly at a fairly decent clip. And uh, kind of like what's happening there. I can always take a squirt bottle at this point and just put a very light, bit of uh, moisture or mist on this, and it'll create really soft uh, textural effects in that wet and wet as it's starting to settle into your paper. So I kind of like what's happening there. I think that's looking good. We will come back and work uh, with very, very soft edges on the uh, foam explosion. But for now, we've just created a nice crisp negative shape that kind of mimics the the explosion of the ice calving off and hitting that water and exploding upward. Um, so I'll let this dry and then I'm going to erase some of my pencil lines. The reason I'm erasing pencil lines is because if we don't have a really dark value next to it, uh, to a pencil line, we'll see it through this light, these light uh, glazes. Uh, you, you, the way you pencil lines disappear is if you drop in a real hard, dark value next to it and right up to that edge, and then the pencil just disappears. So I, I kind of like what's happening here. I'm getting some nice effects within this wet in wet surface of the ocean. So it's, uh, it's working. Turn that off. Uh, as I promised, I, I'm going to take a kneaded eraser. And I'll come back. This is all very dry up here around the edges of the explosion. So I'm just going to come back in and just, I, I, they've served their purpose. They have helped me see where my explosion is, but I don't want to have a lot of pencil lines later going through this foam because it'll look very unnatural. So I'll just pick those up and I can come back in and work into that foam now with shadows and, and all kinds of softer edges and we'll, we'll blur some edges. Uh, but for now, the pencil lines are gone. How are we doing there, Lois? We need to uh, give people some more time on their ocean. You don't want to fall into this water. It's pretty cold. Uh, I think that people are quite keen to have a bit of time to catch up. Yeah, we'll give everybody a chance here to yeah. catch up. Now, while, while you're painting, if you could listen, the vertical surface comes down <clears throat> to about, I don't know, 
if you were looking at this in reality, it might be six to eight feet before it hits that water line. And then it starts angling out towards the water. So we're going to see or feel that this, this vertical surface slowly transitions away from the, the ice cliff face towards the water. And to do that, we have to we use some crevices. We have to use some value. And uh, when I say value, I'm talking about shadow versus light. Remember, up at the top of the, the ice cap, we've got a lot of light hitting that. So it's a lighter value. Well, this down here at the bottom, where just before it hits the, the water, kind of angles towards the viewer, it's going to be picking up a lot more light as well. So that means our darks that we're going to start putting into this rock face will be a little darker until they get down to this point, oh, about that far. And you can see my finger spread there. That's about where the, the ice face or the cliff face starts angling towards the viewer. So anything above that is going to be more in shadow. So that uh, works okay. Now, we are we're kind of at a point here where we want to think about enhancing this shadow line. If you have a constant value running along the shadow line of the cliff face, that doesn't feel very natural. We want to see lots of darks and lights and everything within them, but we, we had to establish this underpainting to telegraph to the viewer that this has gone from a horizontal surface to a vertical surface. But now we'll be coming back and we'll start introducing really dark darks in a few of these little crevices. And then they, they come down the face and they just feather out to nothing because the light, the ambient light, the bounce light, the reflected light from the ocean feeds back into that vertical face. And as it comes down towards closer and closer to the water, we, it starts warming up and we see less shadow. So the, the, the darkest, most obvious shadows are going to be right beneath the lip of this cliff. And we do that on dry paper. It has to be very dry. And my paper with my heat gun is now completely dry while I was painting and doing the ocean below and then coming back and hitting this with the, the heat gun. It gave it an opportunity to dry. And you can always kind of lay the back of your finger down on uh, the paper surface. And if it feels a little cool, that means the cotton, the fibers of the cotton inside the paper are still damp. So if you if you feel a coolness to the touch, come back in and dry it a little bit more just to make sure that your paper is like potato chip crisp dry. Uh, and that way, when you go back in and paint on top of it, um, these colors remain. They don't turn muddy. They don't get uh, neutralized. And you start building up layers of depth through these, these glazes. We start seeing and feeling the texture of all the crevices and such. So it's, it's important that your paper is always dry before you go back in and put more layers on. Um, if you work with too thick of a paste, the uh, consistency of your paint, you will never be able to get this, this transparency, which is unique to watercolor. So you always want to use plenty of water when you're laying in these, these glazes. But the flip side of that is it has to be completely dry before you go back in and put another layer on. And then when you dry between each of these applications, you can start building this transparent depth that feels like light filtering through everything. Uh, it doesn't have any opaqueness. Uh, with with uh, oil paint, when you paint with an opaque medium, you have to put the glitter and the and the light on with whites. With watercolor, we're dependent upon using the white, the brightest white of the paper to, to pull these, this glowing effect through the pigments. And the pigments have to be transparent in order to let that happen. So it's, a, it's very important to always work wet, let your paper dry after you put it on, and then put another layer of it, maybe a different color or a darker value on. So it's, it's a process of building value um, around your whites. All right, um, my ocean is still a little damp. I'm gonna dry that just to be safe so that I don't uh, do anything. But if you look at the way my ocean is with this softer kind of wet and wet, lighter value beneath the, the explosion of foam above it, it does sort of mimic what's happening in a lighter value. But you notice that there's a more of a neutral 
uh, glazed over this. It's not as bright as the actual reality of the poem. And, and that's indicative of the way you'd want to paint reflections. You don't want your reflections to be a mirror image exactly of the same value of what they're reflecting. You want the water to, to be a little less uh, bright, typically. So, okay, now, if we're ready to go on, I think it's time to take a smaller round. I'm gonna use this uh, synthetic round. It's a medium size, it has a nice, keeps a nice point on it and it's wet. If you wet it and kind of, you can see that it, it is a nice brush. So uh, I can come back in right underneath some of these places and start putting in values. I'm gonna bring, bring you back to my painting before I do this. This is the sample painting I did. And if you get down lower, you can see some of these, these little crevices of different values that are up in the, the horizontal area. These are the holes in the snow that where there's shadows. Some of them are warm, some of them are cool, but the overall effect of this area above the lip of the cliff is a lighter value. Um, I'm using a little, slightly warmer colors up here because the light's hitting that area. We do a similar thing on the vertical face, but those are all gonna be cooler colors. So keep that in mind as we work with the pigments and the hues in our palette. Uh, picking up my palette, I'm gonna get maybe a little bit of raw umber. I've got some nice, let me back the camera up here a little bit. I've got some nice uh, kind of neutral colors here. It's on the warmish side. Um, and I'm gonna come back in and just create little, a couple of little edges around some of these cliffs or, or chunks of ice that are pushing up. Rather than just outlining them, I'm gonna take a clean brush now and push a clean brush towards that little deposit of paint that I put on. That little bit of moisture that I've just added and pushed into that shape grabs that paint and starts filtering it upward away from that edge. If I take my brush and I, I pull it this way, I'm pulling all that dark value away from that edge and I'm losing that. Now I can always come back in and change it in a few places and put some cool, like I have a, a bunch of cobalt here that's just in a puddle and I'll pick up some of that and I'll put it in a couple of spots, clean my brush and push a damp brush towards those deposits of, of color and you can see it, it starts to create visible shapes that might be in shadow. I'll come back in and create a couple more, clean my brush, push a little bit of damp towards those darks. Maybe I need to get some crevices coming down through some of these things. So I'll just use the tip of my brush and create little crevices in there. And I might add a little bit of this pink warming it up a little, but counter it with a little bit of a cool color around. And, and remember, these other areas that I'm designating as little ice sheets that have pushed up are dry because I dried my paper thoroughly. I'm just coming in up and creating little secondary edges and negative shapes in this surface up here. And rather than have too big of an area that's all defined, I might just take a brush and just kind of smear some of these edges so they're not all perfectly defined. But we work around the painting and start creating these little divots, crevices, whatever, um, that are, they're gonna dry and leave little bits of lighter area around them. But I don't always just leave a, a big chunk of uh, color. I just, I wanna soften any of these, these bits of color that I've laid on here leaving some hard edges. So it's it's a dance that we go through that goes back and forth between hard edges and, and softening these edges. If I leave a hard edge on one side of a brush stroke, I wanna soften the opposite side so that we start to see chunks of edges in negative shapes that are very subtle, but it's telling us that there's, there's texture here in this uh, area. And I might come back in now with some bright violet. It's a little stronger, uh, but it's not quite as bright as the, the pink. 
bright violet by Holbein is a beautiful color when it's kind of tempered down a little bit so it's not quite so intense. It stays warm, but it's not as hot as like a quinacridone rose, which is like a um, opera. Anyway, there's I've, I've started to get some nice texture going. We'll come back after that dries and we'll continue adding additional. I'm going to move over to this side now with some cobalt and some uh, the bright violet. See if I can't get some some purples in here and just start adding a few little um, bits of texture. Clean my brush and then soften some sides of these these little edges that I've just created with these negative shapes. Pick up a little bit of warmth with some raw umber. And I'm just, I want to soften the back side of that so it just filters away. Take my finger and just push it away. Um, it just is a matter of creating little holes, but they're not all the same on each side. Just, just parts of them have some depth to them with dark edges. The opposite side is always a little bit softened so it pulls away okay that that gives you the idea you can do as much or as little of this as you want but now the rock face itself is completely dry we've got this nice cool cobalt type uh, delineation along the edge but i want to reach into some of these deeper pockets and get them really darker so here's here's a good one right here i'm going to come around the edge of this and come right down the side Clean my brush, push that wall, push my damp brush up against the edge, and then come back with maybe some darker um, pigment in that wet area. We'll come over here along this edge, leave that edge defined, but then push clean water up against it. And, and that's so raw, I'm going to add a little bit of uh, raw umber to it just to uh, neutralize it so it's not quite so intense. But you can see, this is how we start creating the illusion of a lot of, uh, of cliffs and, and crevices and stuff that are coming out of this, this vertical cliff face. And I'm just always taking one side of these marks and softening them. So they start coming downhill and I leave a little bit of edge on the opposite side of the brush stroke. And you can, you know, I'm not even looking at a photo reference at this point. I'm just designing this as I go. You can design your painting as you go without trying to uh, be a slave to a photo reference. Because at this point, I'm just designing this. I'm just kind of having fun with it. And I've got, I've got to get my darks into these crevices in a few places. And we'll just start popping these darks in here to get, especially as we start getting down towards the, uh, the foam. I want to create um, a little bit accumulation of darks in and around this foam. So I want to get progressively wetter and darker. So I'm going to add more water as we get right up into these areas and um, I'll get, that was a lot of paint there. So we'll just come off of that with a lot of water. And then I'll pull some of that paint in and around some of these chunks of ice that are fracturing and, and just jumping out into the, um, the space in front of the viewer. So we start to see lots of, different values of lighter shapes that are negative shapes that look like chunks of ice that have exploded and are kind of falling away. So this is the detail that's kind of fun to do in these paintings. And I can continue to kind of come down and round some of these chunks that are fracturing away. We can even put a few up in here and just fill in all the way around them so that it looks like there's a big chunk of of ice that's forming up there that is falling. And I can come back with a little bit of uh, ultramarine, get on either side of that, clean my brush, and just pull it back. These are really subtle little shapes 
I don't want to repeat the same shade. I want them all to be very different and unique because they're, they're pieces of broken ice that are just falling. And so this is where you get to be creative as an artist and just create your own reality. It's kind of fun to do that. I'm going to get a little bit more. This is all pretty wet now. So I'm going to start introducing a little bit of the bright violet just to suggest there's even more movement back in here where all this is fracturing. Get a little bit more. You know, that, that violet along over that blue just gives a really, it just takes it down in value a little bit, but it warms it up a little and it creates nice separations. These are softer. All right. I got to come back in underneath this and get a little bit of, of uh, uh, what do you call it, Payne's Gray, just to really get my darks into some of these crevices behind the edge of the cliff where the light can't get there. So I'm going to just soften these so they just fall away, away from that, that edge where the light is above them. All right. That works. Now, we're going to do, I'm going to let you do that, but we're going to do the same thing on the other side. And uh, I talked a little bit about this, this being a little bit darker as it uh, comes down to this and starts angling towards the viewer. I'm, this is all pretty wet and wet right now. So I'm just adding ultramarine into a damp area to make it feel like as you come down that cliff, all of a sudden this gets a little lighter as it comes towards the viewer. It's subtle. All right, and I'm gonna, the, underneath this ice shelf, just before it hits the water, it gets very dark because it cuts back in. The, the water is melting that ice from beneath, so it creates an angle. Once this is all dry, that's something we're gonna come back and do. <laughs> Excuse me, come back and do. I'm just giving you a little bit of a heads up on what to expect there. <clears throat> We may reach a point where we want to come and put a whole glaze over the top of this to quiet it down. I'm not sure if we, or you can take a misting bottle and just throw a little bit of water on some of that wet area in the cliff and it creates little blooms that suggest texture, makes it kind of nice. And I'm just going to pull some of that neutral tint downward into this shadowy area, create a little bit of uh, Raw umber and, and neutral tint, maybe right in here, and it just really kind of darkens this a little bit more. Throw a little water on it. There we go. All right, as soon as you have that side of it done, then we're going to transition over to the, the right side of the, uh, the cliff and do similar treatment. But I want that side to be, this has got some warmth and some, some pinks coming through. It's a little brighter. This is going to be a little darker in value. So we have some transition from, from warms to cools behind that splash. And uh, you'll see what we do. Now, this is now granulating. I, I must have put a little bit of ultramarine in there. I think I did. Let's put some more in there. And it should create its own little textures through granulation. Ultramarine is uh, made with lapis. It's a sedimentary color made from natural minerals, so it's coarse. And when it gets wet and wet and dries, it separates and creates these really beautiful granulated uh, textures, textural effects. So very appropriate for what we want to achieve here. Um, but we've got to let that dry. So um, we need to be at about the halfway point here. So I'm going to dry while you're finishing this up, and then we'll move to the opposite side, and then we'll work on the, the explosion and some of the final touches in the last hour. But we're, we're kind of at the midway point of our paint along. 
And again, it's always important to go back and dry before we get too far ahead of ourselves. So once you've got your paint down, dry it, and then we can continue. One of the things I want I want to have happen is as you look at the top of this ice cap, at the very top of the page, I've got a warm wash in here and it makes this whole thing look vertical. I need to get the top of this to recede. How do we do that? We have to glaze in a cooler color. So using a middle-sized uh, flat, I'm gonna mix up a little bit of the cobalt keeping it cool. I don't want to use uh, the cerulean or the manganese because those are too warm. I want a nice cool glaze about the consistency of weak tea. And I'm going to come in and just glaze this over a little bit. And that's going to make that feel cooler and it'll make it recede back. And as we darken things below here, they'll come forward and that lighter value will just settle down and, and step down a little bit into the background. All right. You know, with watercolor painting, it's just a, you know, stop and go back and forth. You know, you, you put a wet, wet shape down and then you dry. Put another wet shape down and then you dry. Um, if you don't use a dryer, takes a lot longer because you need to be stopping and stepping back away from your painting and evaluating the, the shapes and the values and see how they are holding together. Um, when I'm not doing a workshop and I'm just painting by myself in the studio, I generally don't use a hairdryer, but I'll stop and I might just stare at this thing for 10 or 15 minutes before I decide what to do next uh, because I'm letting the paint dry naturally. And the key is you've got to let it dry and set in the, the cotton so that it, you know, it's staining. And then you can, once it's set, you can come in and put another color on. All right, now, so we're gonna to move to the other side. And um, I wanna look over here and see how everybody's doing. It looks like everybody's still painting. So I'm gonna give you a chance to kind of finish up what we're, you were working on there. Um, Couple of you are done. We'll give you a couple minutes. And we're going to do the basically the same type of approach to the right side of the cliff, but much cooler. I don't know if you can see in the in the camera, but even though this is cool over here, it's got a warmer cast than what we're going to do on the right side. Think of this 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 giant explosion as maybe casting a bit of a shadow. To the right side of the painting, which means we're probably going to use a little bit of ultramarine, a little bit of Payne's gray. Uh, if you have neutral tint, try not to use it. Maybe just use uh, a couple of your blues together because the neutral tint is very warm, almost like leans in the direction of the raw umber, whereas a uh, Payne's gray is a very cool neutralizer. So let's. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to mix up kind of a, a glaze. I'm going to use ultramarine. I'll use a center one here, the center mixing area. And you can see that that has a little bit more red in it. It's not, not as greenish or as warm as the, uh, the other colors we've been mixing. And I'm going to just, just tip my brush a little bit into the Payne's gray. And you can see that just takes it down to a steel blue color. It's you can use a little bit of cobalt with this as well, but it's definitely not as warm as a cerulean or a manganese. And I'm going to come back in and I'm going to drop in some really kind of intense darks up behind some of these little ravine areas. And while they're wet, I'll just set my brush down and I'm going to get my small round and I'm going to push a clean bit of water up towards those deposits of paint so that they can just kind of filter downhill away from the um, the uh, overall 
what do you call it, the uh, edge. We'll get a little bit more dark in a couple spots, let that run downhill. Come around the bend with some of that same color. Get a little bright violet in there and make it sort of a purplish color as well. And I'm pushing a clean water up towards those deposits of paint so that it keeps the, the more intense color up near the edge of this uh, face. And then we just keep moving down. I'm just gonna work myself up into this little, maybe a crevice. I'll take the back of my brush handle and just kind of create a natural little uh, crevice along the edge of the ice. Come back and pick up some of that dirty water. Let it come back down. And remember what I said about this, uh, the bottom here, we don't want to go too low. So I'm going to come back in and just kind of create an area that's gets a little bit darker before it gets lighter again. Now, I've got some chunks of ice here um, that I'm going to work in and around with the ultramarine and a little bit of the bright violet. Get a little bit more of the blue instead of the violet. And I want to come back in and create little exploding chunks of ice just by creating small negative shapes. And I want to get a whole variety of sizes. I don't want any of them to be exactly the same. And this is just kind of a randomus, randomizing my, my brushwork of, of the ultramarine in here. And then I, I dilute it and I just get it less and less as I move away from the, um, what do you call it, the uh, splash. Get a little of that cerulean coming down into the middle of this thing, a few places. Clean my brush, push towards those deposits of really dark. All right, now I'm going to bring that same color down into some of these crevices that are going down, feeding into the uh, ice that, that comes to the water's edge. We'll get a little bit of this, this dirty color that I've got in my palette that I used, had left over from the ocean, and I'll come back in underneath my ice cap with a really rich, dark, um, color. We'll get a little bit of raw umber added to that, so it's pretty dark. And I'm just dragging my brush across here to create variation. Some of these things recess back up into this uh, with some really true darks. I'm, I'm using some of my um, Payne's Gray in a few places to create this little illusion of these crevices. Try not to make the crevices all exactly the space, same space apart. Take a tissue and soften some things in a few places, but you can see you have the ability now to uh, create the illusion of this thing coming towards us just by leaving this a lighter value and getting really dark underneath it. A little ultramarine, a little bit of uh, Raw umber, getting back in this area here. And then over on the other side, you can do a little bit of the same. We've got some crevices that are coming down. We've got the underside of this uh, ice cap that's darker than the water. Comes right up towards the splash. All right, now we'll soften some of this. I'm going to get a little bit more of the, the darker. I just put a little droplet in two places, and now I'm going to take a clean brush, and I'm going to push my brush towards that little deposit of paint. So it's almost like this little um, 
gaps and, and shadows back inside this. Um, get, get my picture back. We there? Yeah. That's the downside of using a cell phone for your camera. If somebody calls you, you got to get rid of them. All right, we'll let that dry and then we'll start working on the softening some of the edges of the foam. I want to uh, actually, I, before we stop, I'm going to take some of this dark that I've got and come right up into a few of these little areas where the uh, rock face is or the ice cliff is and push that, that cooler color right up into the, uh, the lip of the ice. So we see that and feel that coming down. And I'm, I'm directionally kind of bringing these, these crevices towards the, the, the uh, explosion so that it almost kind of guides your viewer to the center of interest. There we go. Now you can really see where some of these, these, uh, these transitions are from horizontal up into the, uh, the vertical. Uh, come back behind this little ridge with some darker value. Come in behind this one. Create kind of a wedge-shaped recess. Get darker still right back up in here. And I'm using a kind of a phthalo blue just to kind of darken some of these wet areas just to really accentuate the coolness of them. But every one of those little drops of, of darker pigment, I've got to come back with a clean brush and attack the bottom edge of them to soften them so they don't feel like they're just isolated brush strokes. We want them to feel like shadows that are, you know, where the light can't get up into these crevices. And they filter out into the rest of the, uh, you know, the light, the ambient light, and we start to see and feel more of the, uh, the bounce light that's warming up the rest of the, the cliff. All right, I'll let you guys do that. We wanna get over on the right side a little bit more. I wanna get more of a crevice coming down, but we can do that after it dries. So I might put just a little bit of warmth with a bright violet in a wet kind of wash and kind of bring that down using the edge or the side of my brush to really put this on here as a big soft shape coming down. Adding a little bit of neutral tint to, I'm uh, not neutral tint, Payne's gray to cool this side off and then go up inside the, uh, the crevice here that where you just don't see the light. Push that up. Let some of this come down. And you leave a few little dry areas that have already got paint from a previous wash on them. So you start to see and feel all these lighter areas that are shining through. All right, we're gonna let that dry. I'll let you finish that up and then we'll start putting some detail in here. Gotta be dry before we try to put any more on here though. You see things that have dried and they've left a hard edge where you shouldn't have one, take a stiffer brush that's just damp and you can go back in and lift. And you can reestablish a softer edge if it, if it feels like you need to go back in and re 
you know, we, we capture that. Sometimes we end up with too much or a too hard of an edge in, in places, and we just have to use a, a brush like this. It's, it's like a half inch, but it's a little shorter bristle. So it gives me the opportunity to blend or soften. Uh, so it's not so uh, hard edged. I mean, just do a little bit of lifting, a little bit of blending. The next thing we want to do is start putting in some, some true darks around our crevices. And for this purpose, I'm thinking a rigger or a really small round, like this small round that I've got here, or my rigger. You can see the size of both of these as I get them up towards the, the camera. Either one is appropriate. I'm going to use my rigger to start with. I might switch over to my other one. But I'm going to get a little ultramarine and some neutral tint and whatever I've got in my palette here, uh, just some junk, um, and just to get sort of a dark. There's the ultramarine. You can see how dark that takes everything right away, but I wanna balance that with some other color. So I'm gonna add a little bit of the bright violet in there uh, to see what that does and maybe a little bit of raw umber to neutralize it. So I've got a nice dark here. It's pretty wet though, so that you know that's gonna dry 50% lighter. So I'm going to add a little bit more of the, uh, the raw umber to this. And it's turning into kind of a nice cool turquoise. But I'm going to come back in now and in a few places, I want to use the whole edge of my rigger to create and then switch to maybe the, the tip of it to create these little holes that are in the cliff in different places. And this one may come down like this. Maybe we got something over here. And these little darks are what make, and, and as you lay the whole edge of your rigger down, some of it dry brushes and gives you just a little skipping effect. And then I'm gonna clean this and get a, a little bit warmer color. I'll, I'll pick up whatever I've got here that's just not quite as dark a value. And there is literally some, some horizontal marks in the, the ice face that you can kind of just put in a, in a subtle way. And I'm going to soften the top edge of these so you don't see a real obvious line. It just sort of suggests that there's some, um, what's the word? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's the, the action of layers upon layers of ice face over the years or the centuries uh, building up creating these little, little suggestions of, of uh, horizontal layers. And if, it gets, if you do too much, just take your finger and kind of smudge it a little bit. You don't need to have it real obvious. It's just very subtle. And in a few places, it's a little darker than others. And it just helps the viewer understand what we're looking at. And you can come in and put a few more of these little crevices in here punch them up a bit in a few places, just so you kind of understand what's going on. This is the little bit of detail that, that helps reinforce what we're doing. I'm down behind this guy a little bit. I like this little crack in the ice here. So we'll just make a dark and that goes up into a crevice and then soften it. Now, above it, on this horizontal, on this side, I wanna, I'm gonna take this down a little bit. So I'm gonna get some more cobalt and make up a, a glaze, a very light, pale glaze. We'll, uh, we'll add lots of water to this in the mixing area. And I wanna just drop this over the top of these two spots, these horizontal areas, because it's just too bright. I want, I want this to be cooler. It's, in, in the Arctic, so it's not real warm out there. We can still see it as a negative shape, but I'm toning it down, making it less obvious. I'll put a little bit of um, Payne's gray back there just to cool it off. Take some of this dark in there. And it's amazing how just glazing over the dry paper, we still see the shapes that we've established. 
but they're just not jumping off the page at us. Our, our attention keeps coming back to what's important, which is around this uh, explosion. And now I'm gonna clean my brush and just soften all of this above those marks so that those dark marks are right up leading into the explosion that creates uh, that kinetic energy that the ice creates. And I'm just wanting to really drop this down in value so that it makes the white negative shape our center of interest. And I think we're about there so we can dry everything and then start focusing on our exploding foam. But I've built up a lot of value as I very gently and kind of subtly work in around this, uh, this explosion here to create a strong negative shape, which is our center of interest. I'm gonna clean my brush, let that settle down, and I'll let you guys get your painting to the point where you feel like you've got a nice, um, well-defined center of interest. You've got some chunks of negative shape of exploding chunks of ice, you know, repelling away from that explosion. And then if you've got a big bead of water anywhere, you can just take a dry brush or a damp brush and wick it up. And that works well. Now it's time to dry. I want this to be pretty dry because I'm gonna take a magic eraser Get it just slightly damp, squeeze all the water out, and I'm going to soften some of these edges on this explosion so it's not, you know, hard edged all the way around. I want some edges to be really soft, some edges to include the exploding chunks of ice, other areas to just be like mist and, and, and foam that's just kind of blowing up in the air. And I'm just wicking up excess moisture that might be beating up with this slightly damp, clean brush as I dry. It's just to help accelerate the, the drying process. And I think that that will take us to the final stretch where we're going to uh, really kind of smooth out some of this, uh, this foam and mist that's coming off this explosion. But your paper has to be dry before we can do this. Can't emphasize that enough. Use my tissue to wick any excess moisture away from the edge. That'll help it dry faster. And I think we're rapidly getting to the point where I'm almost dry. All right, while we're letting that dry, this is, this is a magic eraser. It's a very closed foam densely foam uh, thing that they sell in the hardware stores, the grocery stores. You do not want the new improved versions that has soap in it. You want a, just a plain, dense foam. I take a knife and I slice off uh, a piece. I just take a knife and I slice it off. So I just work with a piece about this size. Otherwise you're wasting the whole, whole piece. But what I do is I, I dip it into water and I squeeze out all the water. Now, guess what? Your hand's soaking wet. I've got water all over my hand. If I drag a wet fingers across my painting, I'm going to be creating a mess. So I always try to remember to dab my fingertips on a towel or a tissue or something. But I've got this slightly damp uh, magic eraser and I can come back in now and I can kind of just twist it a little bit. I'm going to continue to rinse, squeeze and then come back in and just very lightly kind of swish it away from the edge of the of the foam and all of a sudden we've got uh, mist we've got smoke i mean this is applicable in any number of applications for watercolor what we're doing is we're, we're lifting some of that paint we're softening an edge here and there we're retrieving that white and it just creates a a sense of a little bit of mist up there that's foaming away you know, rolling across the landscape. And we also can come back in and use this to create a little bit of shadowing behind some of the layers of foam that are exploding. 
And then I just take a, a tissue and I can kind of soften this like that. I think this is too hard of an edge. So I'm going to come back this way with a little bit of the, the magic eraser. If you don't have a magic eraser, you can do this later after you get one. But they're great tools to have in your kit as a painter because it just helps you go right back to the white of the paper. If you want to create a, a hard edged object, you can just take a light pencil and, and draw something in like a boat and then put this around it. I'll show you how to do it with retrieving these little white icebergs that are floating around in the uh, in the uh, ocean here in front of the, the explosion. And I'm just going to take a little bit of this up. So we just soften these edges and it's, it just creates a kind of a magical softness to it. All right, now I'm going to take some of my paint. I mean, my tape, I've got a, a thin tape here. I think this is half inch. It's a little easier to get angles. My, my ocean is completely dry. So I'm going to let, I'm going to put this on my pant leg to get some of the stickiness off. Put this underneath this one piece of, uh, of um, ice that's floating in the water. Come back and, and put a, a little edge to this to create kind of a random look to it. Take another piece of tape to finish it off over here on the other end. And I can kind of twist it a little bit. All right. I've, I've basically got a nice little shape there. Doesn't have to be anything perfect, but I can, I can come back in and without a lot of energy. Don't push too hard. Just kind of gently wipe it across the tape. Don't go past the tape or you'll be pulling pigment from other parts of your painting. But now I can pick up this tape gently so I don't rip up the paper. And this is why I have you take some of the stickiness off the the, uh, the tape before you put it on your paper. But I retrieved the white of the paper for that little floating piece of ice out in the water. And it just kind of finishes things off with a little detail there that just makes it kind of nice. I'm having trouble getting this off. So I'm going to take my heat gun and loosen up the adhesive under there so I can get the edge and pull it up there. There we go. So now you've got a little piece of white that's out there that breaks up that dark of the uh, the water's edge. I'm going to dry that because I've wet, you know, by doing this, even that little bit of moisture in your, your magic eraser dampens the surface of the paper. So you've got to dry it thoroughly. And then you can come back in underneath it and add a little bit of dark to uh, create a bit of a shadow in the water so that it feels like it's actually floating there. I'll take a little bit of this uh, color that's in my palette. And I can add just a, a touch of darks. And it just kind of accentuates the fact that, oh yeah, there's something there. I, I soften the bottom edge of that mark, maybe even adding a little bit of uh, Payne's Gray to it. But soften it. And now you can actually see it because it pushes a little bit of dark up next to that, that white of the paper and makes it really jump. All right, now we've got all this kind of foam that has very little definition to it. So I'm going to take a little bit of bright violet and I'm going to create maybe a little bit of definition where there's some foam here and, and pick up a little bit of the uh, the blues in it, the turquoises, and just suggest that there's some shape to some of these, uh, uh, what do you call it, the foam run out and the, the explosion upward from the, um, you don't need to do it everywhere. Just put a few darks in and then soften the outer edge away from it. So we start to see a shape that's brighter than the shape behind it. These are very subtle, uh, shapes that are shifting between these negative shapes. And it just, uh, I'm just taking a little bit of warmth, drop that in next to that coolness. And you can drop in and soften a few of these marks. And all of a sudden we've got some, uh, some things happening that give it some definition. Uh, 
that's too dark. So we just come back in and add water and lift. And we've got, and then as we get down towards the bottom, see all this dark that we put underneath this? I'm just going to take a clean brush and I'm just going to come right across that and pull some of that, that dark pigment up into the negative shape and soften that edge in a, in a couple spots here. And it just makes this foam feel like it's, it's moving. It doesn't have a hard edge to it. It's all kind of lost in the foam. Some of it comes up a little higher. Others, uh, I'm just gonna, that's too, too bright. So I'll take my tissue and pick some of that up. But it, it just created some interesting little details. Now I'm gonna come back and get just a couple of little small bits of dark. Clean my brush and push a clean brush so that all we see is the bottom edge of that dark. The rest of it just filters back up into the foam. And I can even pick up a little bit of cerulean, drop a little bit of that down into the crevice. And it just sort of feels like, okay, there's, there is some shadow in this foam, even though it's all white and it defines what's going on. I let that dry. I didn't see it and I didn't stop it and I didn't soften it. So you just take a stiffer brush and you can lift and you fix. Easy peasy. So we'll get a little bit more of the dark down in this crevice here. Take a clean brush and just soften that away. Put a couple more little, uh, darks in there. And now you feel like there's several layers of explosion there that you can actually see. But we've softened the top edge of every one of those so that they just kind of disappear in the foam. Maybe we need a little bit up in here somewhere. And I just soften. And that takes care of that. Now, this, this is a dead flat shape. I want to add a little dimension to that, but it's still damp. I just touched it and I feel it's got some dampness. So I'm going to dry it, but I'm going to come back in and add some, some warmth and that with some bright violet mixed with my cobalt. Let's get a little bit more violet in there. And I'll just Soften this, but it feels a little deeper right above that that uh, big splash. And I'm got some nice things going on. We can kind of see through the splash, and we start to feel like, oh yeah, there's some crevices back behind it there that we really can't see that well. They're kind of soft but they're there. All right. Now, how are we doing on time? we got plenty of time. Let's, uh, let's look at the top surface here. I'll let you guys finish that up, but I'm thinking about where my next step will be. And I'm going to go back up into the horizontal surface and start adding a little bit of richer color and uh, darks up there just to define some of that. Uh, we've done a really good job now of, of defining a cool vertical face to this ice cap. But now we've got to go back in and get some warms to create little uh, textures and holes, snow holes and, and shadows in the horizontal surface. So that'll be what we do next. Um, the other thing we can do is where we've got all of this exploding ice that's kind of ricocheting and falling. I want to get some darks in and amongst that. So I'm going to take, while this is dry, a little bit of ultramarine. And I'm going to get in here with uh, some darker darks and create a little bit of dark. And then I'll clean my brush. And I'm going to come back in and drop a little bit of water on the outer edges of some of those darks that I just put in there so that it feels like, wow, we're looking through some really bright pieces of snow. Remember, those snow things already have color on them. But by putting darks next to them, we feel like we're, we're seeing brighter pieces of snow out there in the uh, or ice that are shearing off and creating these fractures. So you've got to have uh, some darks in there to make that work. 
and you can't have just a big chunk of uh, value. You've got to soften it with a little bit of water next to the, the darks to make them feel fairly realistic. And that, that little bit of dark in there now really starts to draw our attention as this might be a, an important part of the explosion. Those three little dots I put in there, I'm going to take a clean brush and pull some of that, that water or that pigment away. Constantly cleaning my brush. So I, I'm attacking these dark values that are wet with a, a kind of a damp brush. And it filters and softens those marks so that all of a sudden now with that dark in there, we're starting to feel like we can see some real depth. I can do a little bit of this on the other side. Take some darks, come back in like this. And in a few places, when I soften some of these, they connect and they just all start burning. We don't really see, we feel like we're just seeing depth back there instead of shape. And the shape we actually see is the emerging negative shape of chunks of ice that are flying through the air. And that little bit of dark there and a little bit of dark down here work together to kind of coordinate the explosiveness of this, this uh, overall ice uh, shearing, uh, calving ice that's falling off the, the face of the ice cap. All right. We can do a couple more things up here in the top. That, what I was talking about earlier is what I'm going to do. I'm letting these, these wet marks just kind of flow. The water is kind of moving within them. And I'm not too concerned about you know, what they do. I just want the water to kind of move, move those pigments around so that they create a softer edge back in the foam. But we're going to take warmer color up above and get maybe a little bit of raw umber. I've got mostly blue and I've got to clean my brush, get, get some raw umber. It just looks green to me. So maybe I've got too much blue in there and I just need to clean that palette, that, that well with my umber. Now you can see I'm getting some warmer shades. I'll take a little bit of the quinacridone rose and add to that. It's a very neutral warm glaze. I can come back in now and just put a few little divots. I'm going to take some burnt sienna. It's a pretty bright color. And I want to get a little bit of that dark in there in a couple of spots. Clean my brush and push down and soften some of these edges so that they just kind of filter away. We don't really see. All we see is the, the negative shapes that are merging between these, these pieces of color. Get a little bit of purple in there that's in my palette. Clean your brush, and then just soften the backside of these, these marks so that they're like little sloppy dots of, of color that are very transparent, but they, they suggest shapes. They suggest texture. They suggest that there's, there's stuff going on in light and shadow that we may not be able to fully understand, and we don't need to. It's not in our center of interest. It's just creating the, the, uh, the context for all these snow fields that are back up there that are rugged and rough and got all kinds of uh, stuff happening within them. So we might have some crevicing coming down. These are a little bit warmer now. Be careful you don't mimic the same shape over and over. It's easy to do. But I'm going to leave that alone, let that dry. Do something similar over here with a cooler approach. We'll, We'll pick up some of our crevice that dried pretty light. I'm going to add a few little um, darks in here that come down. We'll leave that alone. Time to dry. While you do that, just if you want to break up any of these shapes, if they feel like they're too too obvious, just take a stiffer brush, kind of break up any long line. The eye goes immediately to any uninterrupted straight edge. 
So you want to always soften or lose or you know just have a couple of these edges disappear in places with and just by bringing a little bit of lighter value in amongst those areas, it just suggests that there's soft light going across everything. But overall, we see that upper quarter of the page is a lighter value than the vertical surfaces of the of the uh, ice cap. So I'm going to put a little bit of something here just to suggest that that goes vertical. And then while that's drying, I'm going to mix up a little bit of white gouache. I don't know if anybody brought any white gouache to the to the party, but I have a rapidly diminishing tube of Windsor Newton uh, permanent white. And I don't put this in my palette. I use, I use a separate little junk palette that I've got because if this gouache gets in my other colors, it contaminates them. But I'm just gonna squeeze a little dot of it out into one of the mixing areas. And I'm gonna take my rigger and I'll mix, I'll get a nice consistency of water to paint so that I've got some, uh, some nice movement there. And I can recenter my painting and right above the foam a little bit where it's really dark, I might drop in a few little splatters of white that almost suggest that there's movement. And then even over the, the, uh, the ocean, I'll put a little bit of this in front of it. So it's little sparkles in the water that show up. But that, that, is one way to do it. Now, another way to do it, you take a toothbrush that's just slightly damp. You, you pick up a little bit of that, that white gouache in your palette and just use your thumb to scrape across the edge of the, of the uh, toothbrush and you'll put out a really fine mist of, of white and then it will only show up where you've got some dark uh, value on your paper. Anything that's light, it won't show up at all. But like where the water is here, I can take a little bit of this gouache and just put a little light foam or a little white fine spray from the toothbrush across it. And that takes care of it. So now I'm not going to use that water. I, I use one of my mixing water uh, containers. It's now got gouache in it. So I'm not going to use that for anymore. But uh, I can always take my rigger and sign anywhere on the darker part of the water down here. I, uh, if you, it, it shows up best if you've got dark background behind it and use a white gouache to sign your paintings. You can always come back with your rigor and get some of the darker um, pigments in your, in your palette, like ultramarine blue and whatever else you might have mixed up, a little paints gray, maybe a little bright, bit of bright violet. And we can come back and we can put a few little divots in here that are part of your, uh, um, you know, little crevices in the ice, but don't do too much. It's, uh, it'll get too busy. It's just whatever detail you want to add. It's kind of your painting. You get to design it the way you want. You notice I have looked or even referred to my value or to my photo reference. I use the photo reference primarily to set up the architecture of whatever my composition is. You know, it could be a landscape, it could be buildings, it could be people, it doesn't matter. But I'll use the photo reference to get my, my shapes arranged kind of where I want them, get them in the basic proportions. But then as I'm painting, I'm designing this myself. That's what makes this painting mine as opposed to a copy of something else. And it, it's an impression. We're, we're creating an impression, uh, not a replica, because we've taken liberties with, you know, designing the layout of the whole thing. So that's what makes it fun is, is you get to create some really, you know, fun things, these, these little crevices, the values, the color. It, it becomes something from your imagination, which is much more interesting than a photo that you're copying. So um, I would encourage you to always try to take that approach when working from a photo reference to just always have fun with it, create something that's that's really uniquely yours. And I'm just trying to maybe get a little bit of value in there. There we go. Just wanted to get that to come down a little darker on that side. But 
for all intents and purposes, that is the, the direction of the painting. And I hope you can see it well enough. We'll post this for you on cluster. We're using cluster, right, um, Lois? Yes, certainly, yes. Yeah. And uh, so everybody can see it. And then I hope that you'll post your paintings. I'd like to make comments uh, with everybody so that I can take a look at what you've done. And the intent and the purpose of doing this is to work with a negative shape with watercolor as a, as a very bright center of interest, put the, the vertical ice face of this cliff in shadow and make it cool, but full of other colors. We, we want it to be colorful and lively and then uh, have light hitting the upper surfaces as well. And then make sure that the water definitely feels like water instead of the vertical ice. So we've got a horizontal plane that the, the uh, calving ice has crashed into. And the water down here comes towards the viewer as a much darker and warmer value. And then we have this beautiful transparency on the in the shadows of the ice cliff. And that's, uh, that's the whole lesson on here that is how to create these impressions by applying a wash and underpainting, letting it dry, putting on more color, letting it dry, Every shape that you put down, take a clean brush and soften one edge of that brush stroke so it feels like light just filtering in and amongst all the different uh, contours of the land. So that hopefully is feels um, evident in the way your painting is coming together. Uh, I, I think there are, it's a lot of fun. We don't get to see these all the time. So getting to paint them makes them more interesting. So. I'm going to come in with a little bit of dark underneath this um, cap here. All right. Can't wait to see what you guys came up with. <laughs>